Natalie, thank you so much for being here with us. We um, are going to be talking today about geriatric pregnancy or advanced age pregnancy. Some practices call it, depends on um, where you are, but what that entails, what that means for you mamas and um, how you can make the best of uh, pregnancy at a slighter later age. Um, so Natalie, you were Jen's midwife. Yes, I was. Um, so tell us a little bit about your background and how you got to where you are now. Okay. Uh, so I became, actually this year, I'll be a nurse for 30 years. Um, I went into nursing, um, graduated in 1990 and, um, decided that I liked, did medical surgical nursing, which is a typical path that most, a lot of nurses do initially. Um, had my first baby and had a very um, profound experience giving birth. And because of that experience, I decided that I wanted to go and work in labor and delivery. So I started working in labor and delivery in 1992. And um, in 2000, and, and um, just um, became very passionate about women being able to choose how they want to give birth and really wanting to partner with women and making a difference in them having a positive birth experience. So that's what really um, inspired me to go back to school. So I've been a midwife since 2007. Wow. Okay. That's so cool. So you made your way around many um, facets of the medical field before landing in midwifery. And do you have a practice? Do you work with a practice with OBs or how does it work? I do. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I work in a, um, a practice where we have six OBGYNs and we have six nurse midwives. Um, both groups have our own patient patients and um, our physicians are available for consultation, um, backup if we needed to do a cesarean, um, but we really do have separate practices. Okay, that's really cool. And is it in a hospital? Sorry, yes, I work for Peace Health OBGYN, so in Bellingham, Washington. Okay, that's so cool. So Jen, can you wanna tell us a little bit about your labor experience? Um, with Natalie? Uh, it was, I mean, I, I've kept Natalie for both of my babies and I begged her to be in there for every birth. She was the only one I wanted. Um, so both experiences were great because Natalie's super empowering. The first delivery, she actually let me pull my son out. I didn't realize I was pulling him out. I thought she was handing him to me. And then for my little girl, uh, Sam, my husband got to deliver her so she's just great. She makes it fun in there. She listens to me completely. She knows what my plan and my wishes are going into it. And she does everything she can to support that. Like I'm to me, labor and delivery, it, it's just kind of a fun little party, even though there's some pain involved. Um, we just have fun in there and the staff at Peace Health, the, the, um, the staff there in the delivery area are just, they're all fantastic. So it was good. That's awesome. Yeah. That's so good to hear. And that, that labor is a party is a testament to <laughs> how wonderful you are, Natalie. So that should be a big compliment. <laughs> well, it's also a testament to her attitude. Attitude's a lot of how you go into things, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Um, and then Melissa, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. So um, my name is Melissa and I obviously work with these lovely ladies here. Um, and I'm actually 37 weeks pregnant. Um, and I am also considered geriatric because I am 39 and having my first baby. So yeah, I'm excited for all this. I'm excited to talk about it because I think there are a lot of misconceptions out there. And I think you know, whenever anybody's ready to kind of have a baby or whatever, like, you know, it's kind of, everybody has their own timeline. So, you know, right. more power to, you know, at any age, you know, to, to have these babies. I don't know if I would 
I, I guess I've never thought about going into labor and delivery as like a party, but that is a good attitude. To have. <laughs> I, you have a good sense I, of not that bad for you. I'm, I'm yeah. curious. I have a question for Jen. Jen, did you ever, did, what kind of terms did you remember hearing when we would talk about your age and pregnancy? We never, I was never referred to as geriatric or even advanced maternal age that came from somebody else um you never treated me any different I just had one extra set of things to do at the end with this because my first baby my son was at 40 and then I just had this little gal at 43 and I mean the only thing I did extra was extra non-stress tests the last two weeks Mm -hmm. um, just to make sure that everything was going fine there and that my placenta was still working well so mm-hmm. I'm, I'm passing her off yeah I, she's wearing velour i i really really dislike the term geriatric <laughs> pregnancy and elderly prima gravida and elderly multi gravida um so I, I, I do, re, I mean, advanced maternal age does have some increased risk factors, but um, I, I just feel like calling it elderly or geriatric is, it feels derogatory to me. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, I, I do just like that one. Yeah. So I don't use those terms. No. Okay. <laughs> and so you what never you guys, have with me. What do you guys call it? So I call it advanced maternal age. Okay. And it's one of a, I mean, every woman is different. So for instance, we'll use Jen. Jen's like perfect. She's a, she's like the perfect woman who, older woman who just is choosing how to have a child at 40. She's in good shape. She's healthy. She has a healthy diet. Um, She works out. Um, She doesn't have any chronic illnesses. I mean, that's, that, that's a big difference of taking, and, and normal BMI, that's a big difference taking care of a 40-year-old or 43-year-old woman like that, as opposed to a 40, 40-year-old woman that has, you know, a BMI of 40, doesn't work out, um, has a poor diet. Those, she's going to have a lot more risk with her pregnancy than another healthy woman would. Okay. So, at that age. Right. So how do you define advanced maternal age as in what age do you kind of cross over? So in our practice, um, it, it is, is so in general, advanced maternal age is 35 or old, older, having a baby. In our practice, we have chosen to do, at, starting at 40, implementing additional antepartum testing like the non-stress test jen was doing at 36 weeks on Mm -hmm. and then we recommend induction of labor at 39 weeks why why do you um do the induction so the induction we do the induction because the risk of stillbirth does go up a little bit after age 40. we don't know why that is okay there's we don't we don't know why that is, but we do know that it does increase. Interesting. So, what are some other risks or concerns um, that doctors and midwives have with with um, older women? So the yes. other one, so the other one, which is it, it's um, it's it, you have an increased risk of having a baby that has say Down syndrome. We'll take Down syndrome as a as an example. Um, and I pulled some t- statistics out for you guys. Um, so just to see, kind of put it in perspective, um, these are the number of um, babies that would be born at term with Down syndrome. Uh, the chance of that happening, say at age 30, is one in 939. And then at age 40, that decreases to one in 85. Oh, wow. So, that's a big jump. And then if you go to age, at age 45, it, it becomes one in 35. Wow. I didn't realize that it was that big of a jump. It is a big jump. So with that being said, 
genetic testing, I know one of the questions is, is that is, is genetic testing mandatory? And it is not mandatory. It's very much a personal decision. Um, many, many women who um, choose not to do genetic testing because they would not do anything with that information. Mm -hmm. I was one of those. I chose to not have it done. Um, so uh, what about increases in preeclampsia, for example? Things Correct. Okay. So um, anything, what about, you know, babe, the baby's growth through the nine months? I've heard that they can measure um, sometimes smaller or uh, over. Um, right. What would you say for that so there's not been any change there's not a difference between we're talking about like growth restriction like exactly yeah and growth restriction there hasn't been a difference between ages there's not in the research that i looked up recently there's no no increased risk of that with being older okay okay now preeclampsia there is so for instance um many things that we're doing right now um one of the ways that we prevent preeclampsia is putting people on baby aspirin every day. So I think Jen will probably tell you that. Um, did I have you on? I had you on baby aspirin, didn't I, Jen? Uh uh. Oh, well, I should have had you on baby aspirin. I was good. <laughs> so one of the things um, that we do is we have kind of a um, a. I don't know what you call it, a scoring system. Um, and so one of the things that would um, want, one of the measurements would be like, if you're over um, 40 or over 35, we would um, put people on ba baby aspirin and that helps prevent preeclampsia. I probably didn't put you on it because you didn't have a history of it. No, and I didn't get to see you for the majority of that in between, the in between visits. Oh. Right, right. Yeah. So it's only effective if you start it between 12 and 13 weeks. You can't start, you know, it's not effective if you start it after, after 28 weeks in your third trimester. Oh, interesting. So it has something to do with um, when the placenta is forming. There's something about the aspirin because we think that it, it comes from some kind of abnormality in the placenta that causes the preeclampsia. And so there's something about the aspirin that helps reduce that, that abnormality. That's so interesting. That That's so interesting. What about like um, a change in diet where you would include, for example, beet juice and beets in order to really um, get your circulation going and all of that within the six months leading up to conception? Yes. So I think any woman who's choosing to, to delay childbearing should really, um, I don't know about beet juice or, but just of course, in general, right. yeah. Changes in new, yes, yes. right. Absolutely. And, and I would say that at least a year ahead of time, I mean, I would go in and, and see your, your practitioner kind of get a good physical, make sure you don't have any kind of anything pre-existing. If you have a BMI, if you're overweight, um, if you can drop some weight before you get pregnant, that's really helpful. Um, diet, exercise, going into pregnancy, being as healthy as you can. Okay. And that's, I mean, all, all women for sure. All women, all yeah. women. But, but when we're younger, our bodies are a little bit more forgiving. We can abuse them a little bit more and not have, <laughs> right? Right. Before they start sticking. <laughs> Before they start sticking, yes. Um, okay, so I have a question for you. Do you do you know if there is an an increased risk the older you get? Because we are planning on where I'm 30 currently, and we are in mm -hmm. no rush to have a second. I mm -hmm. want to eventually, but we're th thinking maybe four or five years down the line. Is there an increase in stress put on the body that leads to maybe autoimmune down the line for the mother when you have a child later on? Yeah, that's interesting. Not that I know of. Okay. Not, not in anything that I've read. 
Now, certainly if you have preeclampsia or if you have gestational diabetes during pregnancy, you're more at risk later of developing diabetes as well as developing hypertension, cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. So we do know that. But as far as autoimmune, I don't, I don't know. I would say my autoimmune did not get worse okay. um, after the birth of my first son or, you know, I mean, I'm five weeks into this one. My autoimmune was way worse when I first had it and didn't know how to control it. Um, Natalie's actually the one that helped me figure out that's what was going on with my body. But wow. now because I know how to manage it and control it, it, I'm not affected at all by having the babies. Okay. That's really interesting. Um, that, yeah, that's just a question I have had for a long time. Um, in, uh, cause my mother has multiple sclerosis. So I wonder she had four children in her, um, her youngest she had when she was 42, 43. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. You, you know, who knows, who knows, but, um, something I've always wondered. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I, yeah, I, I don't know. Okay, we'll have to start our own research on that one. <laughs> we'll get on that. Um, okay, and then a question from our Facebook group is, should I have a planned C-section knowing the risks prior to giving birth? Um, because, uh, so I, I need a little bit of clarification on that. this one. Is it because... Uh, people are thinking it might more, be more risky to have a vaginal birth when you're older as opposed to having a C-section? Um, I guess so, but let's just um, kind of make it a little simpler. Like you said, should anyone, if you are of advanced maternal age, should you have a planned C-section or is it safe to try for a vaginal delivery? Absolutely safe to try for a vaginal birth. That's not, uh, that's not a, an indicator for having a cesarean. Okay. just because you're advanced maternal age. Okay. Um, okay, good to know. Um, and then the genetic question, that was when you already answered. Um, can you go into a little bit more about what genetic testing is, what um, you know, it can tell you, what you can test for, and why someone would need that or want that? Okay. So genetic testing is very much a personal decision. So as a clinician and as someone's midwife, I feel like my responsibility is to give the information. And then it is a woman and her partner's um, job to decide if that's something that they would want to pursue or not. And then I support them in whatever that decision may be. Um, So genetic testing is um, anywhere from what we call um, non-invasive cell-free DNA testing which is after 10 weeks of pregnancy, women can um, get a blood test. It looks at the amount of fetal cells that are circulating in the maternal system. So there has to be a certain percentage for them to be able to interpret that. Um, And with that, they can see the DNA of the baby. So they can tell with Down syndrome, they can tell with another one called trisomy 18, um, some what's called micro deletions, um, and a couple of other um, other um, genetic disorders that I can't even remember because there's so many out there. Um, but the main ones that people are concerned about are the ones that are like Down syndrome and trisomy 18, which tends to be not um, uh, a lot of times not compatible with life. Um, so that's the most sensitive. That's 99%, 99 point something percent accurate. Um, but even if that test came back positive, we would still send someone down to a maternal fetal medicine specialist and they would do some additional, like a, a very targeted ultrasound, which is kind of a higher resolution where they can look at certain features of the baby. Um, but they can't do that till about 15 or 16 weeks. But So that's the most um, sensitive. We tend to not offer that test unless someone's had a history of a a baby that's been affected by a genetic um, disorder or um, somebody who's 35 and older. That would be another person that we would offer that test to. It's it's expensive and not um, not all insurances cover it. The next one is called a um, integrated sequential screen 
which is a blood test and then an ultrasound looking at the thickness around the baby's neck. It's called the, the nuchal thickness. Um, and then they integrate that blood test with that measurement of the baby's neck and they come up with a, a risk ratio. And then we repeat that test again around 20 weeks. So that first, the first part of the integrated screen is between 11 and 13 weeks. The second part's around 20 weeks. That's a little bit more accurate. Um, and most insurances will cover that. I would say probably 50% of my patients decide to do that test. And then um, if they have that, uh, and then with the, um, then the, the one that's the, the least sensitive is called the quad screen, and that's a maternal blood test between 15 and 20 weeks. And that also gives a risk ratio of Down syndrome, trisomy 18, and then also um, an open neural tube defect or spina bifida the same same okay. thing same thing gotcha. yes um okay so that's a lot of information um i, didn't I know that there were so many i thought it was uh, i didn't realize there were so many different options wow yeah um, well there's yeah and then we're not that we're not even talking about amniocentesis and some of the other stuff but yeah those are just the general like when you go in and, and you're pregnant, those are what usually people get offered. Wow, okay. And again, so mainly, you know, if you have a family history or a child who's been affected previously, Correct. et cetera. Okay, okay, that's yep. good to know. Um, all right, let's move into something uh, movement-based. So exercising while pregnant, um, we obviously are big fans. Can you tell us, a little bit about intensity level and precautions to take um, in an advanced maternal age, you know, exercise, woman exercising during pregnancy. Yeah, well, again, I would go back to, it really goes back to the individual woman. So Jen's probably in better shape than I am, um, but she's younger. But I mean, there's some people that I have that are, you know, there's, 40 year old women that are in really great shape and there's 20 year old women that are in terrible shape. Mm -hmm. um, so I am a big fan of almost all exercise in pregnancy. Um, you don't want to do any kind of contact sports, horseback riding, you know, things that you could, that could cause like an abdominal blow. Um, but I have, um, I think Jen was doing um, CrossFit. CrossFit. Yes, I have a lot of women that did, did CrossFit their whole pregnancy. And really, the, the main thing for me is that you listen to your body. Mm -hmm. And that's really, really the key for everything, really, for women during pregnancy, during labor, during birth. It's listening to your body and trusting your body and not pushing it. Um, so pregnancy is a state that you you're growing a human being. So that's where your energy needs to go. So you need to not be like training. So you're not trying to increase your fitness. You're trying to maintain your fitness. Okay, I like that tip, maintain your fitness. I really like that. Um, and to go with that in our whole program, and now I've learned that there's other modifications that we need to make to our exercise program yes. so that everything's safer for the baby and, um, actually make labor and delivery way easier because it was night and day from my son's labor and delivery when I just went straight CrossFit to when I learned more of Erica's principles and applied them and did the push prep method for this one. And I mean, delivery was like so easy. It was kind of ridiculous. I was like, it was all over. Okay. I know it was fast. It's a good thing Natalie showed up. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, all right, guys, what, do y'all have questions um, just in general about your pregnancy, you know, experiences? Melissa had a good question when we were chatting before. <clears throat> um, yeah. Yes, yes. Um, and kind of like what are, what is defined as risk? Because, you know, being, you know, in the older woman population, 
Um, yeah. I think it's kind of like when some people just understanding and asking, making sure that they ask the question, because sometimes when people say, well, your risk doubles, it's actually like a half a percent or a 1%. Exactly, that's exactly right. It's exactly so, right. So when we're talking about, say, stillbirths, um, we're talking about a risk that goes, so a woman who, um, who's under 35, her risk is going to be somewhere like around 0.6%. And then when you're getting to be um, up to between 35 and 40, it goes up to, or let's see, let's go to one, let's go to 40. It goes to 0.8%, 0.81%. So we're going from point, what? 0.6 to 0.8. That's of a person. So, yes, it does go up, but I mean, you can say it, it doubles, you know, you're 50% greater, mm -hmm. but right. it's still less than 1%. So, that leads me to a question Do you feel like um, there is some almost kind of fear mongering towards women? Yes about uh, advanced maternal age. Can you speak on that a little bit? Um, I think there's a lot of fear mongering in, in just in childbirth and pregnancy in, in general. Um, you know, it's always, it, it's like uh, pregnancy is a disaster waiting to happen. Yeah. Which is not, it's not. It's a normal physiologic state for a woman. And, um, so, I, I, I don't know, it, it, you know, my, the midwifery philosophy really um, is different than the medical management philosophy. So medical, you know, medicine, they're, in medicine, you're, you're trained to diagnose and treat and midwifery, it's more of support and educate mm -hmm. and empower and provide information. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. absolutely which is why it's so cool that there are practices like yours that have a blend of both right uh, you know medical and the midwifery side so you really feel super empowered yes yes that's great um I, I, oh yeah if i could say something. yeah no I think what you're doing, Natalie, is great because I know, um, you know, working with my, you know, midwife or whatever, um, it's been a really great experience because it is very much about, you know, sharing of information and it's like, you know, you can ask questions and you don't feel like you're rushed in and out. And you also like whatever decision that, you know, my husband and I come up with, like, there's no judgment either right. so it's not like mm, you sure you want to do that like <laughs> you know like maybe option a is better you know so i mean that's been really really great for us because again they they've given us like all the information etc and one of the things i was gonna kind of circle back on on the genetic testing thing is so we did the one of the first ones there was like a blood test um you know to test i think it was like like 11 weeks like you had talked about right and then there's like a second one, I guess, like some somewhere in the twenties or whatever, something right, like that. Street. Yeah. Okay. So, but what they so we were like, okay, yeah, we'll we'll do it or whatever. But then the midwife was like, you know, you may want to think about that because there is a fifty percent false positive rate on that test, and so she's like, you know, you can you can do it, but she's like, if you're going to have, have like your ultrasound that basically like checks everything, she's like, that's more accurate than the test because she's like, and you'd also don't want to kind of be waiting around for a couple of weeks till you get the, you know, your ultrasound to make sure everything's okay. You get a false positive. Right. So I think, right. Like, you know, women just educating themselves. Like if they do want to do the genetic testing, like what does that look like? You know, how, what are the, the factors that go into the numbers if you do get a positive, if you, do, you know what I mean? Things. Cause I think yeah. everyone's kind of this too. So it's like, don't put extra stress on yourself. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's why a lot of women choose not to do that because they hear about the false positives. So yeah. like the first one you had, that's very, very accurate. But in order to check for the neural tube defect, that's the other blood test you have to do around 20 weeks. But they can, they can 
they can look at it pretty accurately on ultrasound and be able to see if there's an opening or not. Yeah. And then, yeah, that's what they told us too. And so we chose not to do the second one. Yeah. Because we're like, well, what's the, you know, it's like flipping a coin. Kind of. so, right. Yeah. yeah. A coin that can give you extra stress, you know? Exactly. Now yeah, you're stressing yeah. about it. And that pregnancy yeah. anxiety. It's like, yes, we have to put all of that on ourselves. Yeah. yeah. And I was I pretty agree. anxious with this pregnancy anyway, because I had lost my one prior. And so right. I don't think I really even trusted my pregnancy until about six months wow. in. And so I didn't want the test because I've known a number of women who've had the false positives and I wouldn't have changed anything anyway. And so that would just leave me stressing and anxious through my whole pregnancy that I was already anxious about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I just trusted the ultrasounds and <laughs> clung to every ultrasound I got. Oh my goodness, I can imagine. Yes. yes. Yeah. <sighs> okay, so um how about the differences with the frequency of visits and then monitor I mean to the practice and monitoring or test for uh women specifically over 40. So that would I guess we touched on that with the stress test, but can you elaborate on um, the differences? Yeah. So that's really the only thing additional that we do. We don't do any additional visits. Um, and um, we just do additional testing starting at 36 weeks. And that's just the once a week non-stress test. And then um, and then recommending that women get induced at 39 weeks. Okay. Um, okay. So then after that, it varies upon, you know, mother by mother, no matter the age. As- right. Okay. Right. Yeah. And Natalie, the wasn't the main reason why we do the non-stress test is because for those women over 40, um, doesn't the plus the placenta has the chance of dying off early, which they think might be why they get the more stillbirths. And so the non-stress test is watching to see if the baby is moving normally as if it was getting normal amount of nutrition and, and oxygen and whatnot from that placenta, right? Yes, that's the theory, but we don't, we still don't know why Mm -hmm. that, why that, why stillbirth is increased as you get older. But the theory is, is, is something to do with the placenta. The, the, the oxygen between the placenta and the uterus gets compromised somehow. And so, yes, doing the non-stress test tells us that the baby's well oxygenated in a non-stress test, in a non-stressed setting. Right. Got it. Okay. Thank goodness they have those. Right. I live for those. Yeah. Yeah. I can. Plus you get to sit in a nice comfy chair with a nice warm blanket. (laughs) That I have my blanket right here. Nothing beats a nice warm blanket. (laughs) I have my baby blanket right here. (laughs) Yeah. I cannot focus without a nice warm blanket. I have one on me all the time. (laughs) Oh man. Um, okay. So another question I had, do you, uh, find with your clients that there is an increased um, risk for postpartum depression, hormone depletion, burnout, etc. Um, with your moms at, of advanced maternal age? I have not. Um, I think, and, and nothing that I've read says that there's an increased risk of that. Um, I think there's a big difference between baby number one and baby number two. Um, I think Jen could probably attest to that too. Um, but um, yeah, I haven't I haven't noticed a difference between the two. Okay, if you don't mind me asking, like, what what differences do you see between baby number one and baby number two? Wow. Well, baby number one is it, it is. Um, It is the most overwhelming experience having a baby for the first six weeks. Um, Just having this little human being that you're responsible for 24 seven. And um, they really, they don't come with a manual. You have to figure them out. It's on the job training. You haven't breastfed before. And so that's always challenging. Um, So then when the second one comes along, it's like, oh yeah, I, I know newborns make these weird sounds and you know, you're kind of, you're, 
you know what to expect more. You're more relaxed. Yeah. Oh, that sounds nice. Okay. (laughs) Second babies are wonderful in so many ways. (laughs) Yeah. That is really good to know because for my first baby, it was, oh my goodness. It was like, what in the world? (laughs) Yes, it, and it happens in an instant. Melissa and I had a great conversation about this yeah. the other day, just about how no matter the age, no matter you know what number baby this is, or you know how many times you know, how long you've been a nanny or whatever, you have to mentally prepare for pregnancy or for having this baby um, as much as you physically prepare. I mean, yes. really, yeah. really, really focus in on how that's going to feel, the sleep deprivation, prepare yourself for everything because it comes fast and it can be a little scary. I mean, you know what I mean? Because it's very scary. Yeah. And you yeah. can't reverse it. You can't like say, no. oh, wait, just a minute. <laughs> right. Time <Okay>. out. <laughs> and then with the postpartum anxiety, even the thought of that, right. then comes this massive wave of guilt for even allowing yourself to think that thought. You know what I mean? Exactly. It's exactly. It's just such a roller coaster. So yeah, we have to do a better job of, as, you know, women in the industry, uh, you know, for preparing women for that hormone shift and how that is well, going to be. supporting you know, women. <laughs> yes. Supporting women, I think that's where we're really lacking in the United States is is how much postpartum support yeah. that we give or don't give. That is, that is so true because I have heard that about a lot of people as well is that what they say is that like oh, while you're pregnant, before you're pregnant, you get all this attention and all these doctor's appointments and everybody's kind of monitoring, making sure everything's okay. And then you have like one postpartum visit and you're like done you know, right. you know wait <laughs> you know so that's yeah it's you interesting you find a good pediatrician your pediatrician yes kind of steps in <laughs> as your like counselor your site your midwife okay. i think yeah my pediatrician yeah. follows up on me more he pretends to call for my babies but then he always starts with how are you how's this going so oh that's yeah really natalie good. found that's me the best pediatrician that's a special person. That's really cool. Yeah, that is cool. But yeah, to no. go with your question, Annie, like for sure I had postpartum depression with Wyatt and I hit it pretty darn good until about a year when I saw Natalie at my post op or my, my year out. And I, I then admitted to her, I'm like, okay, I have these things going on. And she's like, okay, yeah, you, you've got postpartum depression. I don't feel that same way. Um, how I felt after Wyatt right now with Callie. I mean, it can always sneak in at some point later, but I think just the not understanding the exhaustion, the overwhelmingness of everything, um, feeling like I was literally swimming in an ocean with boats all around me and nobody would like pull up to help pull me out. Mm -hmm. And and I haven't had that feeling yet. Um, And hopefully I don't with Callie, but for sure the postpartum was big with my first baby right and to touch on what you said too I didn't realize you know I was struggling with that you know switch until maybe 16 months yeah like you just don't you're in this haze and you just don't even realize it so you know to the moms who see this it's you know it's okay we've all been there you know what I mean yeah Yeah, absolutely time for that fog to clear um a but fog yeah, I, is a good way to describe it. Right? You just yes, kind of like, what day is it? Who am I? Who is this? Like, <laughs> and who am I? That's a right. big one. You, like I did. I totally lost yes. myself. But I didn't have those crazy symptoms that people make as the big thing for postpartum. I didn't want to hurt myself. I never wanted to hurt my baby. But it was this like loss of identity, um, feeling alone, feeling like I didn't have help but yet I didn't know what to ask for for help um that was what I had and that's why I don't think I ever like I think oh maybe this is that but no but then at a year when I saw Natalie I said this is what I'm feeling and she said okay yeah this is what you have and it it I mean it was the simplest easiest fix for me I just needed a little boost in my was it progesterone yeah yeah and I was great wow Um, Yeah, and I feel like so many women, I mean, almost 
every woman I've ever met who's had a baby has struggled with some sort of that. And like Melissa and I were talking about again the other day, it would be so great if instead of, you know, we save some of the money we put into the nursery and the baby showers and everything, which are so wonderful. And, you know, you feel so nurtured, which is great. But invested that in our postpartum mental care. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah for sure. Four ninety nine mindfulness app or whatever. Oh, yeah. You invest. Housekeeper. Housekeeper. <laughs> exactly. Uber Eats membership. Like whatever. Just yeah, invest that's a some great idea. Of that money into just something that's gonna make you feel lifted up, even just you know for a little bit, a little bit of peace. Um, and then you know. That's the best idea. That is. We yeah. need to tell people this is a good gift you need to give for a bridal, or yeah. bridal shower, baby shower. Right. Put something into mama's postpartum mental health. Yeah. It's a good idea. Well, I think with your first baby, you're so wanting, you want so badly to do everything right. And, and so you feel like you got to do everything. And, and that's what I think we, we try to do as women oftentimes, but um, at least with our first. And so it's, I feel women have a hard time like letting the house go and laying down and taking a nap when they have a, a sink full of dishes, mm -hmm. even though they know they need that nap when the baby's sleeping because they didn't get any sleep last night. Oh man. But we put these expectations on ourselves, right? That's, that's very true. It's, it is interesting, you know, because my sister told me something she's, you know, in her twenties or she was the first one in my family to have a baby, but she told me, she's like, you know, don't worry about whether or not you think you're doing it right or wrong. She's like, because the baby doesn't know any different, you exactly. know, she's like, it doesn't matter. And she's like, you just kind of have to do what works for you. And, you know, I totally agree with, you know, like, like any, we were talking about like, you know, hiring like a postpartum doula or having some sort of that postpartum help because I think you know you, you don't realize how much you need it until it's there and then you're like oh wow I really needed that you know right. and obviously I've never been postpartum so I'll keep you posted but you know <laughs> yeah I can imagine right so, but yeah. since it is your first baby do you feel like since we have talked about it so much like ad nauseum that you are you maybe can visualize yourself recognizing some symptoms of just kind of burnout and overwhelm totally yes I think I think it's been good to you know talk about it as much because I feel like it's kind of one of those still somewhat taboo topics that people don't like to yeah. talk about but yeah. for me like, I think it's you know I think it's one of those things that I want to be as where as I be aware of it as possible. Um, and I know sometimes I've heard that people have said, like, even though you're as, you know, you can mentally think that you're going to know, like, okay, yes, this is postpartum depression. When you're actually in it, like, sometimes you have to have someone else kind of point it out to you and be like, okay, you know, like, I think right. maybe you might be struggling a little bit with, with this because, again, like you said, like the exhaustion, the fog, that everything kind of, wiggles its way in but I I also think me anyway um you know kind of having being older and and knowing you know more now like works to my I guess has worked to my benefit because I kind of know more of like what questions to ask like and it's not just so much reliant on you know my midwife or OB or whatever it's like okay well hold on a second like knowing that the midwives are even out there or that like there's doulas right. and every all these other you know tools for us to use that I think that has really benefited me. Whereas if I was in my early twenties, I wouldn't I wouldn't know any of this. You know, so right. Yeah, and yeah. that's a really good point. Like the older you know you get before you start having children, the more you see other people going through pregnancies and having kids, and you can really hone in on what you feel is going to work for your body and how you want to play this. Um, you know, and some of the decisions that might be out there for you. Whereas, like you said, someone who is much younger and not, you know, at a time in their life where their peers are having children also, it might be different for them. Yeah. And yeah. at least knowing yeah. their options are out there. And, and I'm, I'm interested, like, do you, Natalie, do you see, you know, 
you know, in your practice, do you see a lot of women that are of like a certain age bracket or or is it just all across the board? All across the board. I I see that I I don't see as many teenagers as I used to, um, but I'm in a different area. Um, But I do have some teenagers. I would say the majority of women are probably in their 30s. Mm. We have a lot of women that are your age, 40, 39. 41. Yeah. That's encouraging. That's really encouraging. Yeah. yeah. Lots. I think, I think it's interesting too, because I do feel like sometimes, you know, like, I guess you could say like, I consider myself this too. So older woman or whatever, like, but, but you know more. And so you, you kind of gravitate towards that more midwife approach versus just yeah. kind of like the approach. Like what you said is that they diagnose and treat, you know, you're like, well, wait a minute. Like, I feel like there is, there is a whole other aspect of it that maybe is not being talked about. And so right. I think that's what really, I think also like kind of drew me towards it was that, okay, well, wait, there's all these other options that you didn't even know existed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Anyway. I know one of your questions was about breast milk production over 40. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. That's our uh, yeah. next taboo subject. <laughs> yes. No, there is no difference in breast milk production. And in fact, um, women who are over 35 actually have higher breastfeeding rates than, than younger women. I'm not so, that statistic. Oh man. Well, <laughs> that's, but okay. that's why we can talk about it. Cause like, it's a shame thing on so many moms and that's okay. It is. Yeah. It's yeah. like, but yeah. you don't have any you don't have any control over it no. right right exactly another yeah another reason we have to mentally prepare ourselves because right you exactly. might have this vision of you know breastfeeding your baby in this beautiful bathtub of milk and with flowers and it does not <laughs> happen like that and that's okay you guys that's why <laughs> but it can be a mental shift so yes. i don't know if natalie was in the room yet with me but my nurse that was in there with us also, she had issues nursing her first baby. And so we were talking about that. And I said, you know, I'm already mentally prepared. If I have to supplement again with this baby, I'm going to be okay. And it's not going to be this three month, like mental issue on me that I'm failing my baby, but I was wrong. I did. I didn't take into effect those darn postpartum hormones. And so for the first few weeks, it was still a mental game for me that I couldn't produce enough to just only breastfeed my baby. I mm-hmm. had to supplement. And now I'm fine with it. But those first few weeks, it was still a mental game, even though I knew everything was fine with my son. It made things way easier to just whip out a bottle out you know, in public with my son. But it still became kind of a a darn mental game for me those first few weeks and I didn't think it would be hmm. but you know part of that is the, like you said those hormones yeah you oh, totally. right so you can't you just have to ride the wave you can't fight them it's gonna happen no yeah. matter what yeah yes yeah you, <laughs> to ride the wave. you do you gotta ride the wave you gotta ride the wave and just gotta say whoo that came and went and it was hard <laughs> but it's gone <laughs> kind of a huge yeah, tidal I, wave yeah I, it, it 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 hurts me it hurts my heart to hear women feeling like they're a failure you know when they um women feel when they can't breastfeed or if they aren't able to have a vaginal birth these expectations that we put on ourselves um that, you know, we all have these hopes and dreams and the perfect birth and breastfeeding and all those things. And then life happens, right? Um, And just, it would be good if we could just be so much more supportive of each other when we're going through struggles or when we don't have the birth that we want. Um, Well, this was so wonderful. Natalie, thank you so much for coming on. I think we're frozen. Here we go. Oh, there we go. Jen? Yes. We're frozen. All right. No, we're done? Yes, I think we're freezing in different frames. Okay. 
<laughs> okay. All right. It was nice to meet you guys. Bye. Thank you so Have much. Have a wonderful burst. Thank you.